You're welcome back. And to begin our conversation on food security and improving food affordability, let's take this background report by Abdul Salam Jibril. Recently, the cost of food has been a concern for many households across the country as the prices of basic food items continue to rise. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, MBS, in March this year, food inflation stood at 40.1%, with experts insisting it simply translates to more pressures on pockets of Nigerians. Some other experts, however, admit that this trend is not just a Nigerian issue, but a global one, affecting people's ability to access nutritious and affordable food. Available data from the United Nations World Food Programme, WFP, reveals that 26.5 million people across the country is projected to face acute hunger in the June to August 2024 lean season. This is a staggering increase from the 18.6 million people food insecure at the end of 2023. The WFP blames conflict and insecurity, rising inflation and the impact of the climate crisis for the staggering statistics. Other analysts note that since Nigeria is subject to periodic droughts and floods, it has had an adverse impact on agricultural output and increased the vulnerability of populations, especially in rural areas. Last year, amidst rising food prices, President Bola Tinubu declared a state of emergency on food insecurity in the country, a move aimed at boosting agricultural productivity and reduce the high prices of major staple foods in Nigeria. The development, no doubt, is in line with the government's short, medium, and long-term strategies towards addressing the challenges of food affordability and accessibility in the country. Similarly, at the National Economic Council meeting in February this year, steps were taken to ensure food security and put an end to economic challenges confronting the nation, including making fertilizer available to farmers and the establishment of agro-rangers to tackle insecurity in farms. In April, the government released 42,000 metric tons of corn, sorghum, and millet to ameliorate the suffering of vulnerable households. There have also been calls for action against dollarization of locally produced commodities like urea, which some experts note is impacting negatively on fertilizer prices and agricultural productivity. What more should the government do, particularly sub-nationals, towards ensuring food security and improving affordability of food across the country? This and more will form the crux of discussions as guests speak on food security, improving food affordability in Nigeria, shortly. <music> All right, thank you very much, Abdul Salam Jibril, for that background report. And uh, joining us here in the studio to discuss food security, improving food affordability, is architect Kabir Ibrahim, president of Farmers Association of Nigeria, AFAN. Thank a pleasure you to much. welcome you to thank Good Morning, you. Thank Nigeria. Thank you for having me. All right, we have also been joined here in the studio by Dr. Ken Okoha, national president, National Association of Nigerian Traders. Thank you very much for coming on Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you so much. Good, Good morning, Nigeria. Hello, Victor. We have all regulars today on the program. <laughs> and also joining us here in the studio is Ni Akisuju, Chairman, Independent Media Policy Initiative. He is also a financial and investment analyst. As usual, thank you. It's a pleasure. Good us. morning, Nigeria. <laughs> and also joining us from Kaduna is Professor Yusha Ango. Professor of Finance and Entrepreneurship, and he's also the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academics, Kaduna State University. It's nice to have you on Good Morning Nigeria today. Good morning. Good morning, Nigerians. All right. Uh, Juma says we, are, we have uh, regulars, regulars, all today. regulars, yeah, uh, who will come to discuss an irregular uh, problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, food, food prices, food prices, you know, seem to be at an all-time high. You know, some say it's inflation, um, others say it's food insecurity, and some others say the food is available 
but just unaffordable. So let, let me begin with the uh, president of the All Farmers. Uh, he will be able to tell us whether food is available or not. How do you see the challenge? What's your reading of the situation on ground? Well, uh, thank you very much for bringing this topic up. Uh, the question of affordability goes to food security, really. Because let me uh, define what food security actually means. Food should be available, affordable, and nutritiously balanced mm -hmm. for there to be food security. A nation will have food security if it has all this. Now, at this time, this is June, we have always had um, more difficulty in <coughs> accessing food because a lot of what has been produced before has gone into the market and bought over and we are waiting for new harvests. Now, because in Nigeria we depend very much on uh, rain-fed agriculture, this has been a problem that we have had for a very long time. Peculiarities like this now began in earnest in 2020 when we had COVID-19. It made the food uh, system, the global food system to suffer. It was all over the world. Everybody had problems with the food system. To the extent that in 2021, if you remember, the Secretary General of the UN convened a food system conference all over the world. And uh, there were many attempts to ensure food availability for all people. <coughs> and then to go towards food security for all nations. And uh, we had SDGs 1 and 2 that clearly uh, spelled out the issue of hunger and uh, poverty. Mm -hmm. And that every nation was supposed to work towards that. And Nigeria is not an exception. Over time, we have had so many windows, so many attempts to bolster the food system in Nigeria. Very often, we had very good policies, but the implementation had been a problem. I would take you back to 2016, 2015 and 2016, when we had the agriculture promotion policy in Nigeria, which had very lofty uh, deliverables. <coughs> to the extent that I think the CBN keyed into it and came up with what it called Anko Boroa program. And when it was launched, it portended good, a very good effort, at least in rice, even though it was conceived to be for rice and wheat. I remember I was one of the people who escorted Mr. President then to Kebu State and it was launched. Somehow, I think along the line, the CBN did not implement it very well. It was not uh, as if it permeated the system and reached every farmer who really had a farm. But was this supposed to be a CBN thing? Well, the CBN always intervened at that time in so many other uh, aspects. As an architect, I know that they intervened also in physical development. They were, they were doing uh, centers of excellence, providing hostel accommodation, academic facilities in institutions and many other places. Uh, to the extent that I think, if you look at the cumulative intervention even in that sector, it was far more than what the Ministry of Works and Housing had. So it was not surprising that they intervened in agriculture in the way that they did with trillions of Naira. But even when it began, we cautioned that for institutional memory, it should be through the Federal Ministry of Agriculture. It didn't happen, but I thank uh, Nigerians 
and uh, commentators for coming out to share their opinions on it. And now I think uh, the CBN has, is changing tactics because um, recently I think it gave the Federal Ministry of Agriculture 2,100,000 bags of fertilizers to give to farmers free of charge. So, so what, what is the issue exactly? Now the issue, I am going back uh, through memory lane to tell you that uh, a lot of efforts have been made a lot of efforts have been made, but there are problems that constitute or are inimical to food produ production and productivity as a whole. Now, chief of these are the challenges of, I started with COVID, insecurity, flooding, poor implementation of these uh, policies, and corruption. Nigeria should have no business getting into this mess if things were done properly. Now, the purchasing power of the Naira recently has compounded the issues because so many people will tell you that if you go to any of the farmers market here in Abuja or even to the market, you will see food items, but they are not readily available, I mean affordable to people who earn wages for hard work. Now, this is very serious, and this is why I think you can even see what is going on. The labor is asking for <coughs> a minimum wage of about 400 and something thousand, even though government is coming forward with a small fraction of it. Now, what about those people who don't earn wages? Yes. What, what is going to happen to them? And we all buy from the same market. So the problem is going to be exacerbated by even the wage increase. Because we know in this country, any time, and this is something empirical, from Udoji to date, any time there was a change in a, or a, a movement upwards in the wages of people, there is the corresponding inflation, which is not even commensurate with, the, with, with what people get. Uh -huh. So it's a, a catch-22. Yeah, you, you, you give people what they ask for, in the end, they suffer more. So Nigeria's situation is such that we have to think properly on how to solve the problem sustainably. Yeah. Don't, don't do one-off interventions and think that these things will simply peter out. No. Yes, talking about one-off intervention, you've, you've mentioned the so many interventions by subsequent governments, you know, and uh, like the uh, operation of Feed the Nation, the Green Revolution, and that was even then in the 70s and the 80s. Mr. Ken Okoa, I'm bringing you into this conversation now. You know, Nigeria has the potential to become a, 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 one of the producers of agricultural produce in this world that can even contribute to the GDP. We hear that it contributes 23 point something percent to the GDP. Let's have your own opinion on food security in Nigeria and affordability. Affordability will come after that, but the food security itself, the president declared emergency on food security last year, and the United Nations has said that by 2024, more than 100 million children because that is the age gap. The, the, the older people are less than the young ones will be malnourished without food. What is the situation? What is happening that we, can, we just can't get it right? What are the challenges? Thank you very much, Mayor. I This morning when I looked at um, some of the national dailies and particularly the national economy, I uh, which almost happened like a kind of coincidence, as if they were preempting what this, uh, you know, uh, Good Morning Nigeria was going to talk about. I was almost shedding tears. And um, on Friday, specifically, uh, some of my colleagues met, and we were talking about this same um, subject matter. Um, is food available? This let's move from availability to affordability. And I think that one thing the government has not done at this point is to answer this question. Is it available? At a point like this, I would have thought that we should have 
some data. The Ministry of Agriculture should have come up with, you know, some kind of data, some kind of statistics, giving Nigeria's information about availability of food, giving us statistics. Where are they located? Now, the second point is this, that we have concluded that food is not available. Let's not, I mean, we should stop deceiving ourselves. Let's not miss words. It is not available. That's the truth. Because if you look at what is available and just oppose it with the population, you will find out that it is not there. It's not there. We are traders. We know what is going on in the markets, in the local communities where you bring up this. Are the farmers producing? The point is that most of them, like architect talked about, insecurity caused them to go back. When you are farming, I mean, with one leg in the farm and then one leg off, you can't help the country move in terms of food security. It's not possible. That number two, and this is the real problem we have on ground, which is namely that there were no, would I say, there were poor preparations. Let me say no. Let me not say no. There were poor preparations before the removal of subsidy. And this is exactly what is kneeling us down right now. And because of that, the prices of commodities went up. Why? Of course, transport, number one, was hit off. So, so transportation sector was not off. And therefore, if you are carrying one trailer load of tomatoes down from the north to the south, come on. If you were paying about 250 before the 250,000 naira for that truck before the subsidy removal, of course, now some of the transporters are collecting about 600 to 650,000 naira. Now you now look at that cost and then you look at what is happening on the roads the corrupt practices and all of that you also look at the fact that you are passing this poor farmer who is moving this commodity from one state to another he is passing through some local governments where you have hoodlums in uniforms <coughs> i'm sorry to use that word hoodlums in uniforms and they are not smiling at all and you will pay. So as soon as you pay, you will add it up to your costs. And that's why we are where we are. Okay. And I, I think there are a lot of other things that are, you know, compounding the problems that we are having. Take for instance, in February this year, in fact, let me start from August last year, 2023, government came up when they saw that the food prices was you know moving up and we cried out and government said oh we are bringing out palliatives in fact the government appointed uh, you know the vice president announced that there will be five billion palliative fund to the various states including one hundred thousand you, you know, uh, bags of rice for each state. Yeah, that, that was, and I want to ask, how many states this day, where we are now, how many states, you can count them, that have doled out those palliatives? At a point again, government said, oh, 42, we have 42,000 metric tons of grains that we are moving out. We are pushing out. And to help the poor, the common man on the street. Where are these 42,000 metric tons? Where have they gotten to? And, you know, promises, promises. And once government says this, the people pick it up. All right. The, 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 that uh, inspires hope and then uh, maybe dashed along the line. Uh, uh, to an extent, 
I can relate with what you say. I mean, basic economics teaches me that if you have a lot in store, you know, it drives prices down because of uh, there, there's not a lot of competition. What you have, uh, but when it is short, because of the competition, intense competition, prices go up. I don't know if uh, Nii agrees with that. Of course I do. Demand or competition? Because <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, uh, price is a reflection of uh, the forces of demand and supply. So where we jump from availability to affordability, it shows distortion. It, it, once a product is available enough to satisfy demand, the price will find equilibrium. So it is no longer about affordability. So what we have at this time is actually the fact that uh, the relationship between demand and supply is skewed. So you have less, you have less supply that is uh, going into the market. And of course, historically, there have been so much talk about what could be possible for this. It's, uh, I never had a situation, perhaps, so many years ago, where Nigeria had had an equilibrium circumstance around food supply. You know, uh, it had always been a situation of uh, uh, of uh, much demand. You know, outstripping supply in the marketplace. And over a long time, we've had higher, uh, higher. I mean, concerns for high costs of uh, food. Which had related, I mean, which had uh, manifested in high inflation uh, rates, food inflation rates. And up to now, perhaps even for the past 12 years or thereabout, food inflation had been a major contributor to headline inflation. So much that uh, uh, the, 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 the average Nigerian house, household, spent about 56% of its uh, earnings or income on food. So it shows the relationship you know, between food and uh, food demand and other forms of, uh, uh, of, other forms of demand in, in the household. Now, what that substantively tells us is that food is the most important common denominator in the Nigerian household, which also requires fixated attention, either at the level of four tires of government so we are here today with 40.6% of uh, food inflation, the highest in about uh, two decades. And of course, there are so many issues around that that we can talk. But fundamentally, I think it's structural. Structural because, one, we have uh, a tire of government that is responsible for the biggest contributing factor to production land, the states. Through the land use uh, decree, I mean the land use act, right. it's the, the, the states are invested to the, as custodian of land. And to that extent, it means that it is what the state determines, how and what the state determines the use of the land for, that we would be able you know, to, uh, to use it for, exploit them for. And when you drive around Nigeria on the highways, you see land on your right and your left. And you keep on wondering why are we, you know, challenged with this issue of uh, with uh, with food security? It's, it's Nigeria is a country that should not be complaining about food security, you know, because we have that. See, without without fertilizer, without this other contributing factor, if we are doing our organic engagement with our land we have enough land space so what exactly is happening that we are not exploiting our land i think i can relate with that recently the federal government i think uh, uh, sometimes last last year in the wake of uh, creating new policies i mean deploying new policies to assuage uh, the aftermath of uh, the withdrawal of subsidy said it, it committed to uh, to engaging 500,000 hectares of land, you know. But these 500 hectares of land were going to come from the state. As at May, when we did an audit, just about 16 states, you know, had made commitment you know, to, that, uh, to, to, to that engagement. And it was, what exactly is wrong? It's, it is not about you bringing capital, it's not about you 
making other forms of contribution. It is just to allocate a piece of land to this project in your state and let the federal government take it from there. It's an emergency thing, and it's not. I don't think it's about you losing, you know, by forfeiting the the, the power over that land, you know. So uh, uh, th that is one. Then two. We have long abandoned the rural area. We keep talking about farm gates, farm gates. Farm gates are situated in the rural areas. But there will be no connection between the rural area and farm the gate. city gates as it were. You know, you need to have a functional network of roads between the city, the farm gates, and the rural area. It is, I am from a rural area. I am from Idore in, in, in those states. I have farms, and I know that for a long time, the road leading to my heritage farm, you know, we could not even link the road from the farm to the village itself, the village settlement. Mm. Not to talk of now moving it from to the, the village to the, to the city, you know. So sometimes you, you harvested your product, your, your crops. You found it, you, the, the best you could do was to get motorcycles you know that could only take it in retailer package from the farm to the to the village setting itself and then you have to wait for like another one or two two days or three days at, at sometimes to take that from the village to the nearest urban center and the nearest urban center is not the eventual you know yes, uh, receptor true. of uh, the uh, of the products now you have the wholesaler gathering it at that point in time to move it from the, uh, from the nearest urban center to Lagos or Abuja and other uh, urban markets, as mm. it were, also becomes difficult. In those days, you've lost more than 40 to 50 percent of the products. Now, you, the, the, uh, the wholesaler would have to aggregate, you know, this, uh, the losses on the costs. You know, so by the time it gets eventually to the uh, to the markets in the urban center, the price would naturally increase. You know, mm. so yeah. it's uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's a multi-dimensional <laughs> challenge, challenge, as yes. it were. Mm. You know, yeah, yeah. but but I don't think I don't <coughs> think it's impossible to attend to with critical-minded initiative with commitment and a challenging disposition to resolving this matter. Yes. You know, uh, you've talked about the, the, the demand and how it, it fuels the, the, the price of food and um, states actually not contributing to all the, the efforts of the federal government. Because Ken Okoa talked about 5 billion palliative to states 100,000 uh, bags of rice to states. You keep hearing to states, yeah. to states, to states. You wonder what the state is doing to complement what the federal government is doing. Now let's bring in um, our Professor Yusha Angu into the conversation. And now we are going to go to leave the federal government for what it's doing, which we cannot say it is not doing enough, but what are the states doing to ensure that they complement the effort of the federal government? We have arable land all over the states. I we were just traveling to Akwanga over the weekend, and one of my colleagues from the east was saying, look at land, Jumai, look at land. Can you imagine if we have this land in the east, what we can do with it? Let's have your take on that. Let me, before I discuss or say something about what the states are doing or what they are supposed to do, let me also comment on a few of the, uh, or at least comment on some of the things that have been mentioned earlier. The issue of uh, food security, what it is, and whether or not there are, there are sufficient food, and then the fact that the president had declared a state of emergency on food, uh, and then the palliatives and all of that before I come to the states. You know, if you look at it, the, the chairman of the All Farmers Congress has made mention of something, the seasonality of the uh, supply of food. Uh, we are going to suffer from the reports also we have listened to. We are going to suffer, or we are going to have about 26 million people who are going to be food insecure, or at least go very, very hungry uh, between June and August, which are the lean months according to the World uh, Food Program. Now, this is because the harvest has not taken place. Much of what is available 
has been already used. So that is why so it's a, the matter of demand and supply is obvious. It's very clear uh, as a factor uh, for towards uh, or having of, of, or, I mean, for us to have this uh, food inflation at this moment in time. So this time between June and August is very crucial because by July, August, in some of the uh, uh, north central states especially, you find that they will have started harvesting some of their products and I think that will come to the market, that will reduce the pressure. Now the chairman also made mention of the fact that much emphasis is actually on wet season agriculture. And you know, you know if we, we are serious about actually ensuring uh, effective and, uh, food security and stability of prices, then we must consciously work towards ensuring that we have uh, availability of uh, irrigation-based agriculture you know, for, for farmers, as many of them as possible in Nigeria. Now, the few of them that attempted to do irrigation, we know the various policies that came into play, especially the policy of removal of uh, fuel subsidy and the policy of uh, exchange rate, uh, merger of exchange rates, has not actually came to affect their, their abilities. I know as a farmer, uh, at some point, I was spending 8,000 Naira every day to buy fuel just for irrigation purposes. Now, of course, when the, the fuel increase uh, prices came in, you can imagine what it is. Now, so many farmers I know, you know, especially farmers of uh, tomato and, and vegetables around Kura, Bunkure, and other places in, in Kano, I know they could not afford this fuel. So that means with that problem, there would be, uh, th that's why we are, we are seeing what we are seeing now in terms of prices of over 100,000, 150,000, uh, I mean, for, for, for tomato. So that is what we are seeing and that is what we have. Now, coming to the uh, issue of, um, uh, you know, declaring uh, a state of emergency on agri, I want to implore on government, when you have a state of emergency, let us know precisely what is going to come out of it. You know, it's not just declaration. There must be some things or steps that must be taken to ensure that this state of emergency is state of emergency. Now, in terms of palliatives and distribution of, uh, of uh, grains, you know, different states, we have seen them. States have done some of them, have managed it well, some have not managed it very well. That is what came from government. But I can assure you that that intervention, even that pronouncement that 40,000 metric tons would be released, uh, actually imp uh, impacted on market. So prices were moving on uh, around May, um, around March, uh, around uh, February, March, but then they were somehow stabilized because of this uh, policy. But even at that time, people were projecting that May, for example, would be 80,000 Naira per bag, 100,000 Naira per bag. We are now already seeing uh, 100,000, I mean 80,000 or plus already. So what that means is that Whatever government has probably has been depleted. If they have released the 40,000, they don't have any more, so they don't have the muzzle, you know, to actually be able to contain or control the price. They have done it uh, to a small extent, but they have not done it sufficiently. Now, coming to the state governments, what the state governments and the lower, uh, the lower uh, strata of governments are supposed to do, local governments, is to ensure that, you know, like Ni said, you know, they have access, they provide access roads you know, instead of constructing, um, if you like, uh, bridges, you know, in, 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 in capitals and all that, is to go and actually construct and, I mean, roads that link and bring, uh, link uh, the farmlands, you know, to the urban centers. That will ease this process. Then there is also the policy, there, there, is, there are also some th uh, levies, you know, all sorts of levies that have been given any time you are moving, any day that is a market day, you find that uh, there will be revenue officers, you know, stopping every vehicle, collecting all sorts of uh, revenues. And then, unfortunately, you find road safety there, you find uh, police there, you know, extorting money, you know, not actually uh, ensuring safety. So all of these actually have impact uh, on these uh, prices. So I believe the state governments can do a lot more. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Professor Ango. Well, I in going round, uh, the first round, I'll call it, we've been able to establish a few uh, things. You know, some talked about uh, poor infrastructure in rural areas leading to farms and all of that, food insufficiency, uh, the role of states, inflation caused by removal of subsidy, among other things, and then insecurity. But let me get back. Having all of this to deal with, where do we go from here? How do we begin to resolve 
the issues and stabilize food prices? Well, you see, people have painted a gamut of realities, not fairy tale. Everything that has been said here is real. We can touch whatever is there. But all the policies we have made over the several years that even he mentioned have talked about how to get around many of all these issues. But we have not implemented. I will start with what Prof was saying that when you intervene by releasing from the grains reserve at the time of uh, inflation, you bring it down. And, and you know, you remember the the CADEP, the arrangement that uh, specified, was stipulated that uh, some countries within this hemisphere in Africa should uh, dedicate 10% of their annual budgets to agriculture. It, it was there. The Moputo Declaration is there. And it, uh, there were about four pillars that you needed to address, one of which was um, storage. And you know, in Nigeria in 2008, between 2008 and 2009, up to 2010, we attempted to expand our storage base for instance, the storage capacity in Nigeria is about 1.3 million metric tons. Now, but what's in it? Listen now. If we were only able to lease 42,000 metric tons, and we said that was all, then what happened? What? What is? What? Why did we spend all that money to create those storage capacities? And we had, we do, we didn't have one million. But we didn't have 800,000 metric tons. Why? Some people did not implement what we were supposed to implement. Two, as was also said, agriculture is a rural vocation. He says he lives in a village, no road, and everybody in Nigeria starts from living in a village. We are all village people. We all have our roots in the village. There should be roads leading from place of production to place of need or use. This is what happens in the first world. I will tell you this. Over a long period of time, we used to attend the Royal Agricultural Show in uh, Coventry. And we would stay in London and we would go by rail to the location. From Paddington Station, there is a rail connection up to Manchester, and this Stonehenge is along the road, along the way. And you look left and right, you see flush green with animals grazing, and you have cottage houses and farms. And uh, rail allowed for easy transport of whatever was produced to Manchester and back to London. This is how it is done. If, like Ken said, people take something from, let's say, a market in my local government to Lagos, and they use uh, trucks, and they pay multiple taxes, and they pay high transport costs, and they are traders, how, how will they not add up all this expenditure to the commodities that they are taking. What we should do is to make available transport, specific transport for goods or produce. Now, these two things I've said. Because of climate change, we should learn to use even our groundwater. We should optimize the use of our dammed waters. We should be able to produce year-round so that food will be available. We should encourage people to invest more in agriculture. And we should tell the subnationals that agriculture actually takes place in their domain. It doesn't take place here in Abuja. Whatever the federal government is doing 
is just creating the enabling environment for agriculture to thrive. In the, the actual thing that will help agriculture is work, serious work in the states. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm sorry to tell you that it is only now that I have seen so many governors coming to pay homage and uploading what the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security is doing. And uh, we have had the singular honor of escorting Mr. President to Niger State, for instance, when they were launching mechanization and all that. And I was there when the Mr. President was telling about four governors were there, you know, most of them from the North Central, to support one of their own to do this. And he, I remember him telling them that um, we should all model him, especially now that there are challenges in the food system. We must be able to do what people like him are doing to be able to help to fill the basket of Nigeria. Now, not only should we look at the 230 million or about people in Nigeria, we must look at so the countries all around Nigeria because the market is open to them and they have even more to offer to the traders. When you take uh, maize, the prof was saying maize, a bag of 100 kg is about 80,000. I live in Katsuna. It's about 85,000 there. If you move that to Nigeria Republic, it would be more. So the temptation is that Ken and his people will want to go there because they will get more. So we, we, Africa is one market. Nigeria is the so-called giant. How do you think what we produce will just be limited to here? I, I agree with uh, so many of the speakers who said that, look, the loss of economics around uh, demand, the elasticity of it, should hold. I very much agree with that. But I will disagree with them when they tell me that food is not available. It is available. Because if you can see, recently I've seen some bulletin where I think the president gave an order that you can now import paddy. So many things can be imported so that you process them and uh, you have more food here. Mm. But ask realistically, is it competitive to even import those things and process in Nigeria? What is the landing cost of even milled rice from India to Lagos? How much will you sell it in Abuja? Hmm. Can, you, can it compare with what is produced here? So you know, essentially what we must do is that dictum even though, you know, many people don't seem to understand it, is that we must produce what we eat and eat what we produce. Is there what is no country, there is no country in the world that depends on importing what it eats, especially when you have a large population. But you are talking now, 2024. In 30 years, the population of this country will approach 400 million. So if you have problems now, what problems would you have then? And you are building a country for the future generations. These things that we are complaining about are easier now because of what our forefathers did. What are we doing now to make it easier for our children and grand, great, great grandchildren? So, so this problem is our problem. It's the Nigerian problem. It's not if you say it's government. I, I believe there is a disconnect. What is government? Who is government? We are government. Yes. We are, especially now with democracy, we are the people voting these people into power. We are bringing them into office. So we ask them the salient questions that, look, you are not doing enough. That is why we have this. Do enough. Wake up. Tell them. Tell the truth to each other. Tell the truth to everybody. We are all Nigerians. We have to all wake up. Yeah. If you look at the question of insecurity that prevents people from going to the farms, for me, if my son was involved in this, and I know it, I would simply tell the law enforcement agencies. Otherwise, you know, I'm not helping myself, I'm not helping my neighbors, I'm not helping his 
or her younger brothers or sisters. Uh, all right. Yes. Let, 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 you, you've said you've said quite a lot of things here, yeah, and you talk <coughs> about preparing, you know, things for the future generation. But still, these future generations are not ready to go to the farm. You know, and let's bring in Ken Ukwa into the conversation now. Uh, government alone cannot do it. In other developed countries like in Europe, we see it contributes a lot to the GDP, the farm, farming, the ranching and all that. Now, now how can we bring in the private sector like you are, you know, you know, to invest in improving food processing, that's one, storage and transportation infrastructure itself to boost agricultural sector no thank you very much i'll go straight to the point and i will uh, um, give some kind of recommendations number one we shouldn't deceive ourselves this is an emergency period as far as this country is concerned vis-a-vis -vis food security we shouldn't be ashamed let's <coughs> do some emergency imports for now and i saw um you know what i i what was like um a kind of executive order uh last week mm. and uh, eventually they were saying it was leaked out and i perused through and i saw that look this we have very beautiful ideas lofty ideas i could have i mean we shouldn't be ashamed of any of these things let's make sure that these things can be implemented at least for now. Number two, if we are importing, we should also begin to understand that we shouldn't be dancing around with Naira dollar volatility. The dollar, I mean, the, the exchange rate volatility. First, a situation where it takes you about 18.4 million Naira to, you know, to, to clear a container, a 40 feet container, it doesn't make any sense. Once you bring it, like you, like, like, like actors say, once you bring it, the price will also be ah, up there. Therefore, I recommend government for now as an emergency step should not allow customs to be, you know, using dollar equivalents for clearing of consumer products, at least for now. Number three, I want to see a situation where the governors the regional, at the regional level, mm. the governors and the local governments, you know, uh, well, they are not there. They're non-existent. Unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, the governors, I want to see a, a situation where they will also take some steps. Like what is happening in Niger State, where they have Avadep, the Agricultural Value de uh, Chain Development Program, mm -hmm. now on ground. And the, governor, the government said, look, 10,000 hectares of land for cultivation Part local government, and if you look at the twenty-seven local government, that means you are giving about two hundred seventy thousand hectares of land, and this is not speech by mouth. This is not mounting. They have followed it up critically with strategy, with documentation, and with actions. And you see the tra tra tractors and all of those with food imputes and all of that. I have seen this myself. I am part of the process. In fact, we are leading in the market uh, component. As the and private insurance. sector. Yes, as private mm -hmm. sector. And that's why the, your question is yeah. also being answered. Number four is that at this time of emergency, government can also begin to lay embargo on all of these local government taxes and uh, you know, that, that are destroy, destroying and destructing you know, movement of commodities. That are removed, I mean, bringing up corrupt practices and all of that and hiking the prices of, prices. prices of commodities. Let an embargo. Federal government can do that. And I think that could be done. You cannot be basing, I mean, be, be anchoring on, uh, you know, on uh, the concept of uh, um, IGR and then killing the people. You want to increase revenue, you want to generate revenue, and then the people are dying of hunger. Number five. I want also to see a situation where the Federal Minister of Agriculture calls, you know, humbly calls for a stakeholder meeting. The farmers, the traders, other private sectors, the processors, the manufacturers of food items. Let's sit down and find solutions. 
you can do it all. You are not a man that knows everything. We can push in a little of our practical knowledge on the streets. And then that will help. That will help. And that okay. has not been done. It's not done. It's not done. I'm, right. I'm sure he's here. He's not done. We are looking for... for in fact, I personally have written a memo on this. Okay. Let, 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 let me get me involved again in all of this. Uh, is there a role uh, for the federal government in this matter? Yes, we know that land belongs to the states. But is there a role, policy, uh, for the federal government, maybe through the Ministry of Agri, for instance? Can we halt, at the moment, export of food as a temporary measure and perhaps get the FCCPC to rein in prices maybe a bit? among other things that the federal government can do. Thank you. Let, let's start from FCPC, uh, Federal Competition, Competition and, uh, and Consumer, the Consumer Protection, Protection Council Commission. Commission. Uh, a, a major challenge uh, for the Nigerian economy is that we still don't have a free market economy. We have, a con we have an economy that is controlled by pockets of association. Uh, interest association in the in the space. So, you actually have an oligopoly in place where a number of people come together as association and determine price. You know, uh, so we, we are yet to have that free space where uh, supply and demand determine uh, price, which is supposed to be the primary function of uh, those uh, two mechanisms. Uh, so to that extent, I expect that the FCPC, I think I learned sometimes that, that they were going through markets you know, to see if people were actually artificially determining prices. Uh, that should be the, right, the role of the F FCPC. Now about the federal government. Unfortunately, it's a constitutional thing. Uh, the ownership of land which I know Nigerians, as, as a people, we are tied to our land. <laughs> so it, it's a, there, there's a challenge in relationship, either at the level of the community, at the level of the individual, at the level of the subnational. Mm -hmm. There's so much, there's what, what I call a confluence of conflicts in that space that needs to be unknotted, you know, because you, you, individual ownership itself is challenged. Don't forget that when you get your CFO, is a hundred years, you know, uh, uh, hundred years uh, rent. Actually, some people are just buying land now that had actually expired. I mean, that had actually expired. <laughs> some that have only have twenty years, thirty years. We have that challenge to meet down the down the down the road in another twenty, thirty years. We have another level of conflicts at that level. But for the federal government, I think going forward. In an emergency, as uh, Doc had noted, should actually start acquiring land, you know, uh, at the state level. It has the right, especially if it's considered the the Federal Highway Act. The Federal Highway Act empowered the federal government, especially when it's going to build to acquire land. And as the uh, uh, architect noted, London to Coventry is our model. The shoulders, the shoulders of the roads, you know, if, uh, if we take, if uh, the federal government takes 50 meters to the right, 50 meters to the left, across just about 100 kilometers of road, you can imagine what square meters of land will be available for, uh, for agriculture. And to my mind, one, because it is not, it's near, near impossible to deliver a 20 kilometers rural uh, village to rural, I mean, to urban center road, for instance. We may need at this point in time to acquire that, those kind of lands and, of course, involve the private sector to develop. And you use the basic comparative uh, advantage, which, for instance, I know in, the, uh, in so many parts of uh, the north not central states, um, Liam is very versatile. Production of Liam is very versatile. In so many parts of uh, not, uh, not east, not west, and all that, yeah. rice and, and other forms of grace. In the southwest, you also have a, a comparative advantage of uh, what uh, crop uh, product <coughs> can be produced. Now, because you are building, I mean, you are farming on the shoulders of the road, one, you, are, you avail yourself opportunity of easy access to the road, 
you know, and of course, easy access to the marketplace. That is one. Then two, issue of insecurity would also be attended to because they are easily accessible area for law enforcement agencies. Now, I am saying this because of the emergency situation we have. It does not remove the fact that we still need to develop our subsistence farmers. I usually take, I usually depart from the argument of mechanization. Our culture is subsistence farming. And we need, if we are going to grow into mechanized farming, we need to build on subsistence farming and in most cases promote subsistence farming into mechanized farming. It will not just happen, you know. So there's, there's also a need for that. Then I think there should be this strong focus on agriculture to make it a more buoyant segment of the, of the economy. Uh, over the last 15 years, the Nigerian agricultural sector had only contributed to just about 26 at best, 27 percent of the of uh, the national GDP. It is not good enough because the it is a Greek that defines us. Either during by, by our independence, uh, in the immediate post independence period before we discovered and of course started exploiting crude oil and all that, it is agriculture that defines our economy. So if agriculture defines our economy. We should be talking of, uh, of agriculture that dominates the GDP. So and by the time we are saying that, it becomes a prosperity that is anchored on agriculture. And to that extent, we'll not be talking about food, food insecurity. No? Mm. Yes, indeed. Right. We, 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 we see countries like um, Ecuador and, um, you know, contributing collectively farming and even that at a, you know at a scale of 3000 feet above the ground and then it's collective and it contributes to the economy Let, let's bring in professor Yushao into the conversation the uh, but it will be after the break we'll be right back you're still watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. Before we went on the break, I was trying to bring in Professor Ishao Ango into the conversation. And uh, still, I'm going to come to you, you know, and um, to ensure food availability. Others are saying that states should be able to implement some measures, you know, like um, irrigation infrastructure, agri-development development policy, uh, storage facilities, support for small-scale farmers, and um, the, 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 the words on every Nigerian lives is if local governments where all the lands are situated can get autonomy and be able to use the funds that are, is coming to them from the federal government, do you think it will be a game changer in, the, in agriculture? Like you said, uh, local governments are actually where all the lands are, and uh, if local governments can be have the opportunity, you know, to to have all the funds allocated to them normally monthly, uh, and then directly used by them, I believe it will make a lot of difference. However, uh, I believe uh, we are making progress in that direction. The president is in court, and we pray that uh, we see uh, the outcome of that to be positive. Now, in addition to that, you know, all uh, government uh, at all levels are also contributing. Uh, like we, we mentioned the issue of states, but the federal government also does something. You know, they have this uh, scheme whereby they build roads, you know, to link up uh, with the rural areas. I have seen quite a number of that. I have seen it in my local government. But unfortunately, uh, I think some people are hijacking it somehow uh, because I've seen roads here in Kaduna. I've seen roads in Kanu. Uh, inside the town, uh, which are also constructed. And uh, I believe those roads should have been for the rural area. But, you know, I also want to comment on what Dr. Okoka said. Uh, I don't want to miss this opportunity because, of, like you said, we are regular, we have met, we have discussed so many times, we have agreed, we have disagreed a number of times. I want to agree completely uh, with the position that uh, we should go for emergency importation. Uh, that is not a solution at all. I don't subscribe to it. I don't believe that is a solution. I believe, you know, this is not also not conspiracy theory. I believe what food security is, is that you are able to feed yourselves. The moment Nigeria, you know, reach a point whereby we have to depend on importation for our the staple food, then we can be rest assured uh, will begin to see a lot of conditions given to us, you know, by those uh, countries who are supplying food to us. It now becomes an issue of aid. 
you know, given to us, I had to come with a lot of conditionalities, including accepting all sorts of things, social things, values that do not agree with our own values. I will not subscribe to that. I agree with Architect Kabiru that we have food. We actually have food. But, you know, the policies we have made, and, of course, the impact of the, uh, right from the COVID-19 era, when uh, the COVID-19 impacted globally on food prices, globally, this is across the globe, go anywhere and you find out that that is what has happened. But in addition to that, we have taken some steps this year, in the last one year, we have, those steps are impacting on prices. We cannot remove those things from what is happening, but there is food. One thing we have is that there is food in Nigeria, because imagine, after COVID, after closure of the country for so many months, and uh, or global economy, I mean, uh, for so many months, we came back. We didn't have hunger in Nigeria. We didn't have hunger. Even now, we don't have hunger. What we have is affordability. And I don't think the solution is uh, over, I mean, just importation. I will not subscribe to importation. Uh, I beg to disagree on that count. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm not sure I get the point on uh, when you say what we have is affordability. What we There's have no is hunger. a lack of affordability. Yes, yes. If you can't afford it, well, uh, there's hunger. You're hungry. I, I, I don't know, architect. I don't know if you can piece this together for us. You see, if you say food is available, food is most foods are perishable. If they are available and people cannot buy, they will go bad. And so. Why are people still not dropping the prices, if only to save them from going bad? Well, you see, if they the, are available. the point here is there is a difference or a sharp difference between food sufficiency and food security. Okay. Food security should be looked at as a global thing in the nation. I will give you the example of the United States, for instance. There is no challenge of food. Most people can afford food. If you take a small country like the Netherlands, not bigger than Kano, their income from agriculture is only second to that of the United States. Yes. There are only 55,000 farmers there. That they export what they have. I like what Prof has said. At this point in our in, the, in nation building and in our quest for food security in Nigeria, we should discourage outright importation. Rather, what we should do, and I would like you to take this as something that is well thought out. Food security in a nation that has three <coughs> geopolitical zones should not be global. We should look at Southwest, for instance. What is Tepro? Mostly is Tepro there. Get all the states to come around to scale the, product, the production of that. Go to the Southeast, do the same. Go to South South, North Central, Northwest, do the same. Don't say rice. Rise globally in Nigeria should be produced optimally. There is a disconnect. There are some places in Nigeria where rice is not stable. Don't say wheat. There are some places it is not stable. So if you look at it from that perspective, you will be able to impact more. Definitely you have to import some things. In Nigeria we import, there are things that we import. I mean, you can't do anything about milk, for instance. There is a shortfall. And recently, we had also a shortfall in, in, in beans, in cowpea. We had a deficit of about 500,000 metric tons. So now we are closing that gap. But you know, in spite of that gap, we are also selling to other countries out of necessity. Because the, the borders are not, are not just, just there, you know, in Africa. The borders are very, very slim. Izuma should know. She's from, well, she has lived all her life in uh, Borno, in the northeast. It, some people come in to, to Bor I mean, to Maiduguri, whereas they are actually of Chad uh, extraction. Onijer. And you can't, Onijer, and you can't uh, really define that. And they have relations from across the borders. So there is no way you can say they will deny those people food or anything. And it is everywhere in Nigeria. 
even in the southwest, there are so many borders that, you know, with Benin Republic, with so many places that you have to do this. So, in a nutshell, what Nigeria should do is look at this as everybody's problem. Yes, local governments should have whatever is due to them. Why not? I mean, I come from Faskari. If you give the local government chairman only money to pay salaries and order, nothing to do anything, how, 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 will, how, will, how are we going to see improvement? The local government should also be able to contribute. It should coalesce with the state government to improve the living conditions of the people. The, 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 it's a big mistake. You know, before now, when uh, I, I had my brother graduated as an engineer and he was the head of works of my local government, he, he worked. He was happy working there because there were funds there and they, they, he could do rural roads, he could do many things in that place. And our people are 99% agrarian. So they needed to take whatever they produce to the market closest to them. So, so we must do that. We must give local governments their due. And we must also approach the issue of food security with the geopolitical zones in mind. And what is Temple? Ken will tell you where he comes from is Rice Temple. Is the potato you are talking about staple? Probably is cassava and yam. So whatever quantity of rice you give a child who is used to eating swallow, <laughs> but the person will feel that they have not eaten. In Nigeria today, what it is is that Jume will tell you this. Whatever food you give children here in Abuja, they still ask for indomie. Yes. <laughs> but this Indomie is, uh, I, I think, uh, is luxury. It's not grown it's anywhere. Luxury. <laughs> it's luxury for them. So don't say that you must bring, uh, allow people to import uh, Indomie. No, don't. At a, oh, at no a point, it was even almost the price of half a bag so, of so, rice. So, so, so reality has yeah. made it such that, you know, I had this conversation. I overheard you <laughs> talking about uh, potato, that there is hardship even in, in, in peeling it and all that. Yes. And therefore, you don't take potato because you have no money. Now... When I used to be the president of Poultry Association, I brought a person from Canada, a very thorough scientist, I mean scientist, who said every grown person or every human being should take at least one egg a day. The people have been arguing about cholesterol in egg and all that. 300 milligrams of cholesterol in one egg. It's, there is good and bad cholesterol. Yes. You need it. Today, the poultry industry is almost moribund. People like Ken will not eat egg. And they say there is cholesterol. No, there is no cholesterol. He has no money. <laughs> That's it. Mr. Ken, you but, don't but have doctors, money. But doctors won't <laughs> agree with no, you. No, no, no. Doctors no. won't agree with but you. But you see, the majority of people know this. I mean, we are not... Uh, this is empirical. Ni will tell you, even from the perspective of business. Okay. You, if you are not... Uh, if you, all, your, all your faculties do not work optimally, there is no way you can be able... I mean, you will be able to do even what you do here. Mm -hmm. Scientifically, can you ask us all these questions if you had an empty stomach and if you are not balanced, if your brain power is not there? So we I must be it. able, we must be able to, to really assert ourselves mm -hmm. in bringing about food security in Nigeria and by acting, by taking action. That's by taking not action. Talking. Like the president said that no Nigerian will go hungry. Now let's talk about how we can reduce food waste. There are, there, are, there are places in Nigeria that produce orange, banana, like Benue State and all that. And you find that, that at times it is wasted. It just goes to waste. They just throw it away. How can we build factories, the states build factories, you know, to produce like juice that we buy from other countries which we don't even know the content of the juice. And it can even be exported outside the country, Mr. Ken. Yeah, I, I think under the... Of passenger administration, we had some kind of import substitution, and at that time, I'm not sure we had this kind of uh, volatility in exchange rate that we have today. Mm -hmm. And because of that, a lot of people went into massive production, local production of <coughs> you know fruit juice, like veg, veg, veg or exactly. Yes, veg food, so I they remember. came up. And, you know, you see factories started coming up. And people were making money out of that. And the quantity of wastages in the middle belt at that time that was reduced, I mean, reduced drastically. 
and Nigeria became an eye fingered on if you want good fruit juice, fresh, genuine, go to Nigeria. And in fact, we started exporting to <coughs> other countries within the West African coast. That could happen. But where you have an economy that cannot be predicted, an unpredictable economy, that even the, the environment alone is chasing some factories away. So how? How are you going to invest in that? I know many com companies. Let's move out from food a bit. Even in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, furniture, <coughs> they came. They, they woke up. Shoes. They woke up because of those that kind of policies. Now that brings me back to what I was talking about. We are an, in an emergency situation. And therefore, like Akita Active was saying, there is a shortfall. Would anybody likes it or not? There's a gap. So this gap, what can happen? It has to be filled. It has to be filled up. So emergency import, is that what, is that, that's exactly what we're talking about. There is in trade what we call quota. You bring that, you do an analysis of what Ministry of Trade, Minister of Agriculture come together, give us a data, let us know this gap and see how we can import that. Government can even take it up, import that now. And you will see the price, like you were saying, economics. It drop uh, all right. because of, of we're, we're running out of naturally. Time fast. I, I don't know if Nia agrees with the idea of uh, emergency import uh, just for the moment uh, to bridge gaps. I would have agreed if Nigeria does not have the capacity to fill the gap. Capacity, think, but yes. is it available? Mm. You see, it's, it's once the, the first thing is to acknowledge if you have the capacity. When you acknowledge that, then what, will be, what should be in place to exploit the capacity? And I think that is what informed the president position. I can tell you from what we do uh, that um, the president was placed under huge pressure you know, to, to open the borders for emergency importation. But he had to, he, he, uh, he refused to adopt that position simply because he thought we have capacity. And the, 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 the fact is we have so many numbers of farmers that can fill the gap in Nigeria. Uh, what, what should be the relationship between the federal and the state and, of course, the local government? That should be the issue now. You're talking about waste. The, the state does not have any particular physical role to play in all these things. It's just to enable the environment. Naturally, private, private capital has a way of gravitating to opportunities. Once the opportunities are there, they will, they will, they will go there. You know? So... Uh, you could drive into my farm at any point in time. You will know that that's an opportunity for off-takers. So if you have subsistence farmers, and usually there is neighborhood subsistence farming, so if you get a, to a community, it's likely that all the farmers are on the same axis. So it's easy to do off-taking. You know, so I, I'm, we are producing orange. Yes. We are producing this. Banana, you, the, the, mango, it's easy everything. for the off the car, I mean, for Over. the processor to yeah. come in and sign off taking the agreement with those farmers because he knows at the end of the day he can move his vehicle easily into that into that uh, farm and uh, 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 evacuate whatever he needs to evacuate. So it's processing uh, processing farm. Yes. It's the enabling environment mm. that we need. Yes, enabling environment. Let's bring in Professor Ishao into this one conversation minute. now. In one minute, can you tell us the long-term solution to food availability in Nigeria and sustainability itself? What we need are consistent policies that support the small-time farmer. Yes, the farmer cannot afford mechanized agriculture ordinarily, but then there should be opportunity whereby they can hire I believe I don't have not seen or I've not read much about the Niger State uh, arrangement, but I've seen it when they, they launch it. I believe if they have farms, you know, and I mean equipments at local government level which are available, you know, to the farmer, you know, to hire, that would be good. Then government should do everything to encourage 
especially the research centers we have. Let them bring out better seeds. Let us bring input. Now we said federal government, I mean, Central Bank is giving the Federal Minister of Agriculture fertilizer to distribute, uh, to distribute free. How will they do it? What will be the mechanics? What will be the arrangement? How will it get to the farmer, not the political farmer? Now, these are the kind of supports that the farmer needs. He needs better inputs at cheaper price subsidized. He needs to be guided. He needs, you know, that uh, issue of having uh, people who are able to guide him of the latest technology. That is no longer available, most times uh, available. We have research centers, but they are just there. You know, they are not being funded enough. I believe if we do that to support agriculture. And then every effort should be done by government. And this can be done at federal level to ensure that we have irrigation for that are channeled to enable all year round agriculture. For lack of time, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Ishao Ango, for your input into the conversation. You agree and disagree and come to a solution. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Professor of Finance and Entrepreneurship and Deputy Vice Chancellor Academics, Kaduna State University. Thank you so much for your time on Good Morning Nigeria this morning. Dr. Kelukoa, National President, National Association of Nigerian Traders, thank you so much for coming, as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Ni Akisuju, Chairman, Independent Media Policy Initiative, is a financial and investment analyst also. It's been a pleasure, media as always. Media and policy. Policy, <laughs> media and policy initiative. Thank you, thank you so, so much, much for player. coming. And uh, architect Kabir Ibrahim, President, All Form Farmers Association of Nigeria, Afwan. Gentlemen, as always, it's a pleasure to have you come to Good Morning Nigeria so that we can dig into issues and find solutions. I hope those that matter are listening and can take from this conversation. Thanks so much for watching Good Morning Nigeria today. We appreciate you. I am Jumoy Yosef. Right, and I'm Victor Azo. Let there be food. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yes, let there be food. <laughs> <laughs> That's